giving a different angle on things, like the um, opposition to austerity, which is nothing more than crushing the people, like they were doing um, that uh, in the days that actually triggered the emergence of the Labour Party. And it's putting another point of view to challenge this manipulated, engineered consensus. And while I don't agree with lots of what he says, I think it's great that he's actually there um, coming from a different angle within the same system. Yes, that's the problem I have with it. But it's coming from another angle and it's giving some kind of voice to those the system and the political consensus is crushing. And so if he never got into government, well, how is that going to be any different in the outcome for the, the people, the population, um, to a Labour leader coming in with the credibility to be Prime Minister becoming Prime Minister and then doing the same as the party he replaced. Let's at least have some kind of debate. Let's have some kind of challenge to this consensus which is destroying the lives of so many people. So I'm going to go through, you know, I've not spoken to Jeremy Corbyn, but I'm going on um, the policies as reported um, in many and various um, papers and publications and like the BBC website and all that stuff. And that's another point. When war criminals like Tony Blair and these cronies that took us into the Iraq war and slaughter on a blatant lie, when the spinners who span that story to um, claim weapons of mass destruction um, when they weren't there, when the media, when the sycophants in the party, the self-serving, system-serving sycophants in the Labour Party are all against you, as they are in the case of Corbyn, then you must have something to say, in my view. Because um, when people like uh, Peter Mandelson, the Svengali spinner of the Blair years, when Peter Mandelson's against you, when Tony Blair's against you, when the mainstream media uh, as a whole is against you, then you know you're on the right side, or at least you're not on the wrong one information source, that technologically generated information source, can be attached, connected to human thought and emotional processes and thus feed information into the human individual and collective mind that dictates perceptions, thoughts and emotions. Now, I know at first hearing, um, people will find that fantastic and ridiculous and, you know, what else is on. But it's true. And I've been researching this a very long time. And to um, understand the depth of the human control system and where it is planned to go through what we call the transhumanist agenda, you have to open your mind to many things and you have to go uh, deep into the realms of the nature of reality. And uh, this week I've had um, a long email from a gentleman called uh, Dante, Dante Kalidas. And what he's saying here is that he has um, personal experience, personal knowledge of 
the sort of thing I'm talking about, although he gives it a different name. And I'll just read you some of the information from the email so you can see how in context it is with what I've been saying all these years about this technologically generated sub-reality designed to become the reality perception source of the human individual and collective mind. He says uh, that he's already tried to get this out through the alternative media, but no one has touched it. And he says, so AI, artificial intelligence, and what I know and how I know it, I speak of the government's new world order, putting an astral net in place, David, for monitoring the masses all across the world. Now, that's a very good description of it, what I'm talking about with this technologically generated sub-reality, an astral net, because um, for those who haven't come across the term astral, it is uh, a term for a level of energetic reality that is beyond human sight, which is not saying much because, as I've pointed out many times, um, if you take uh, what mainstream science says about the reality that we can actually visually experience, then the electromagnetic spectrum is 0.005%, some say a bit more but not much, of what mainstream science says exists in the entirety of what we call existence. Actually, it's far bigger than that. Um, and therefore the frequency band of the electromagnetic spectrum is far smaller than even they're saying in relation to what actually exists. But um, when you think of that, 0.005% of what exists is the electromagnetic spectrum. This is mainstream science. And visible light, what science calls visible light, which is the only frequency band that we can decode into a reality we can see, is a fraction of the 0.005%. Now, when you consider those almost laughable um, statistics in relation to what we can perceive, then you can see that almost everything that exists in existence, we can't see. But there are other levels which technology can pick up um, that um, are also affecting our perceptions of reality and our thoughts and emotions. Because, okay, I'm, I'm thinking now, okay, you can see the um, outward expression of those thoughts in my opinions. But what about the activity of thought? I'm thinking now. So can you see what I'm thinking? No. Because that activity, that energetic activity, that electrical activity, is taking place on another level beyond human sight, where almost everything <laughs> goes on. So this astral level is another level of reality that is beyond what we call the physical world. But because, the, as I went into last week, uh, the body is a holographic projection, like the whole of this reality we're experiencing, of energetic fields, it's at the energetic field level beyond human sight some people call it the auric field, but that's just one level of it. Um, it's at that level that you can access the thought and emotional processes, which then become human perception and behavior. And this astral level is part of that energetic field beyond human sight. And so through that astral level, you can access on an energetic level, the human um, 
thought and emotional processes and you can feed um, into those thought and emotional processes those thoughts and emotional responses that you choose. And if you do that, you are dictating the thoughts, perceptions and emotions of either the individual you're targeting or a whole uh, race of people, a whole human race, uh, um, eventually. And thus you are controlling everyone and everything through that means. So this um, email goes on um, about the astral net. Think Minority Report, says the film, and you start to get the picture. Of course, the film is very off, as this will involve remote neuromonitoring and artificial intelligence, which is already used in conjunction with remote neural monitoring, or RNM. Um, to begin with, what is commonly known as remote neural monitoring involves artificial intelligence. He goes on, um, Google stock is way up. You might remember in last week's um, video cast and in my books, I emphasize the absolutely crucial foundation role in all of this, the whole transhumanist agenda of Google. Google stock, stock, he says, is way up because anyone on the inside knows that they are developing artificial intelligence and it is the future. If you are thinking uh, longer than 20 years, people are thinking, you know, that kind of period. Well, it's way off, he says. And my estimate is based on how long this has been tested and obvious plans for the elite. Google will be huge. Anyone on the inside knows this. It is the future. The stocks are high priced for Google. And he goes on. There are thousands upon thousands of people dealing with remote neural monitoring across the world, thus an international agreement and conspiracy. Then we ask why. It is about mapping people's brainwaves, all of their thoughts and thinkings and feelings, a myriad of things here. It is all being collected by agents and agencies across the world. And with this technology and uh, uh, going into a central database, for what purpose? The fact that all peoples across the spectrum are being attacked and affected with this technology points to a collection of a wide spectrum of information in regards to thoughts and feelings of people and all across the board and all across the world. They are collecting all possible thoughts and feelings, cataloguing these, and each of these has a numeric print number which um, with this technology can be used for duplicating said feelings and thoughts. The numeric value given to these are identity prints for reduplicating with this technology and for knowing what is being viewed in the first place. And behind all of it, artificial intelligence does all of the organizing and work in regards to identifying what is being thought and felt. So in the simplest terms, you download thoughts and feelings, all of which have a particular frequency. And then you feed those frequencies back to the population, thus stimulating those same thoughts and emotions, and thus dictating the behavior and perceptions of the population. Because, as I have outlined in the books and did so uh, in the video cast last week, that we are living in a holographic um, simulation, a holographic version of a, if you like, computer simulation, computer game, interactive, um, then these computer terms become very, very relevant to what is going on and how it's being done. Labels obscure unity. When you start to realize that the labels are overwhelmingly just names, masks, for the same force. 
And so before I get into the questions um, in detail, I think it would be good to lay out how the few can control the many. Because when people like me say the world's controlled by a few people, the obvious comeback is that's not possible. There's 7 billion people who can't do that. Well, you can. And I spent a long time when I started on this trail, this journey, putting together the structure of how it's done. Because, you know, you can see the world like a jigsaw puzzle with pieces all over the floor. And uh, what a lot of people do when they're putting a jigsaw together is they try to find all those with straight edges and they create the frame in which the other pieces go. And the more pieces you put in, of course, the clearer the picture becomes. And looking at how the world's controlled, in terms of my own research anyway, has been very much like that. I asked the question at the start, who controls world events? And then the question was, how is it done? And it's when you realize how it's done that suddenly you realize that it can be done. And it can be done with the vast majority of people, even those involved in the structure, having no idea what they're part of and what they're contributing to every day. And the structure can be symbolized as a spider's web, or it can be symbolized as a pyramid. Either way works. We take the spider's web, first of all. If you think of each strand in the web as being an organization that um, is either secret, semi-secret, or out in the public domain, which we kind of know about, take each of those organizations to be a strand in the web. And then in the center of the web is the spider. And the spider is the force that I've been exposing in my books for a long, long time. And from the spider comes the impetus and the um, source for the direction of human society. And because it's playing out through this web of endless secret societies, semi-secret groups and in the public domain, organizations, governments, and agencies, the unity, the unified source is obviously to the vast majority who haven't done the research, hidden. It seems random. It seems like uh, it's just happening without coordination. In other words, it looks like the pieces in the jigsaw all over the floor or all over the table. They're just pieces. But when you put the pieces together, world events become very clear. There's basically three things that we need to know to understand what's going on. Well, three basic things, lots of things on top of that. One, how is it done? Uh, two, what is the goal? The desired outcome. And three, how do they get us there? There's a fourth, of course, who the hell's doing it, which is what I expose in the books. So how do they do it? 
Well, you've got the spider in the centre of the web that is dictating policy. Where do they want to take us? Um, they want a world fascist, communist, whichever way you want to call it, Orwellian global state of total control overseeing a slave population. And by that, I mean almost everyone. It's what I call the Hunger Games Society, where you've got the less than 1% dictating events, a police state, merciless police state, which we're seeing unfolding all the time, imposing the will of the less than 1% upon the rest of the population, the slaves. And by that, I mean people who at the moment think they're doing well and have got plenty of money and, you know, they've not got nothing to worry about. It's not their problem what it is. Because if you're not in the less than 1%, they want your wealth and your security and your independence as well. And so that's what they want. And how they get us there is by manipulating events from the spider source through this web so that these unfolding changes in society appear to be, that word again, random. They appear to be unconnected. But they're not. They're all heading in the same direction if you put the pieces together. So let's look a bit more about how it's done. You've got the spider in the centre of the web. This is this force that I expose in the books. If you look at the strands immediately around the spider, they are the most exclusive secret societies. They um, often don't have names because it's much more difficult to uncover things that don't have names. They are incredibly secret and incredibly exclusive. And they interact with the spider. You come out from the spider and you're now into secret societies that we've heard of. The Freemasons, Knights of Malta, um, the Jesuits, the Opus Dei and all the rest of it. Um, but they too are compartmentalized structures where, as with the structure as a whole, only those deep in the shadows actually know what those secret societies are really about. Most of the membership do not. That's not the case with the exclusive ones. They all bloody know. But I mean the ones that we see. So when they say it's the Freemasons, it's not the Freemasons. It is um, those controlling the Freemasons using the Freemasons and its networks as a vehicle with the vast majority of Freemasons completely um, unaware. Not saying they don't do some unpleasant things in their secrecy, but completely unaware of the big picture and what's really working through their networks. Um, and then as you come out from the spider through those um, secret societies that we've heard of, you start to see um, and meet this, uh, what I call the cusp position, where the hidden meets the seen. Obviously, you know, within secret societies, things are, um, are hidden, and, and with the exclusive secret societies, they're, they're completely bloody hidden. But then you meet this point, uh, this cusp, and that's where you get things like the Bilderberg Group, where they gather politicians and bankers and business people and intelligence people and, and all these different aspects of the web together to coordinate this common um, direction for society. Now, some of the people involved in the Bilderberg group will know the big picture. Most of them won't. Most of them won't. These that come and go to a few meetings and then disappear, they won't know. And from... Um, that cusp where the 
hidden meets the seen of the Bilderberg Group, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, these sorts of organisations which are all connected. You then go into the scene. You're now into corporations, you're into governments, you're into government agencies, you're into the military, the Pentagon, you're into uh, the intelligence networks, the NSA, GCHQ in Britain and, and all these. And the policies in the scene that are played out in changes in society, changes in laws, changes in direction, they appear to be coming from the politicians. But where it all started was back with the spider. And among these organisations in the scene are religions. There's one or two questions about this week. And religions are there to limit people, to limit their sense of self and sense of the world, to give their power away. Because when the few are controlling the many, the few can only control the many if the many give the power to the few. And um, there are many and many and various ways in which humanity is manipulated to give its power away. And religion is a classic. Everything you need to know is between these two covers. Um, and how God wants you to live, what it wants you to know, what he wants you to know, it's always he, um, what you should be um, supporting, what you should be doing, what you shouldn't be doing, um, is um, all there for you in the words of some guy in a frock who is telling you what God wants. And it doesn't matter if it's a, a priest, a, a rabbi, a bishop, imam. They're all the bloody same. They're in that pivotal position between the perceived God, uh, the source of worship, and the congregation. So when I say that this whole conspiracy is in the title of my last book, A Perception Deception, that is what it is. Because the few cannot control the many physically. Well, not yet anyway. There's too many. They have to get the population to behave in the desired fashion so this Orwellian um, global nightmare can play out to its outcome. And how do you get people to behave a certain way? You get them to perceive a certain way. You get them to believe a certain way. And then their behaviour comes from that. I mean, why do people behave in the way they do? Because they are playing out in behaviour their perceptions of a situation, of a world, of a self. So it's a perception, deception, and religions are wonderful vehicles for programming and limiting perception. This is produced, Roundup, by a wonderful company. A company that has a history of putting humanity's best interests first and the health of humanity first. And it goes under the name of Monsanto. And Roundup glyphosate um, is being used almost everywhere to kill weeds and to um, be used on crops, especially genetically modified crops for reasons I'll come to. And it's been found in 
urine, in breast milk, in um, drinking water, in rivers. It's everywhere. And we live in an extraordinarily and increasingly toxic world. Not because the world itself is turning toxic, but because those dictating to human society are making it so for their own agenda and in what they perceive as being their own best interests. So I got a reply back from the Isle of Wight County Council and um, it said the following. In re uh, response to my question, how long has Roundup glyphosate um, been used by the council um, here? Island roads that do this stuff for the council, at least in part, have been using glyphosate since April the 1st, well, that's bloody appropriate, 2013. And prior to that, it is believed that the Isle of Wight Council Highways Department used it since at least 1980. Well, we're well sod in poisoned air by now then. What is it used for? It's used for the control of weeds on hard and soft landscaped areas. In what locations? Uh, it's used predominantly to kill off weeds in pavements and curb lines and only treat what can be seen growing during the application. And this is when you see people going along with, with backpacks, spraying, and even on these quad bike things, spraying as they go along. You know, any people about? Don't know. Does it matter? Um, how often is it used, I asked. Um, Island Roads have informed us that they carry out three applications of glyphosate um, island-wide, treating the hard paved areas of the network. Two weeks is left between each application to ensure that weeds have not been missed. Soft landscaped areas, these are only treated if required. Pew. What is the method of delivery? Island roads use two delivery methods. One is done manually with a knapsack sprayer. Shh. Excuse me, darling. Can I come past? Thank you. Shh. Uh, and one is uh, done using a quad-mounted pressure sprayer. I've um, put in another Freedom of Information request um, asking about the use of this stuff in colleges and schools and... Um, parks and other public areas um, and I know that happens around the world uh, but I've not had a reply to that yet um, but I await with bated breath. Now here we have a situation where public areas of the Isle of Wight and this is not just the Isle of Wight this is places galore in Britain and around the world America massive use of it in America. Um, public places where this poison, which is um, designed to kill things, is sprayed around so people can quite possibly come into it, into um, contact with it directly, or they can breathe it in or whatever. And there are many other ways that it can get into the human, um, the human body. And here um, I have just a few um, things on a list from an um, internet um, article here by the Organic Consumers Association that is detailing those health effects that have been connected to glyphosate and what is known in its trade name Roundup. Alzheimer's disease birth defects, um, autism, brain cancer, breast cancer, cancers of um, other kinds, digestive disease and gluten intolerance, chronic kidney disease, colitis, depression, diabetes, heart disease, inflammatory bowel disease, leaky gut syndrome, liver disease, multiple sclerosis, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, Parkinson's disease,
pregnancy problems, infertility, miscarriages, stillbirths, obesity, reproductive problems, respiratory illnesses. And despite all that, and despite the fact that the World Health Organization has recently um, suggested that this stuff could well be a cause of cancer, the Isle of Wight Council and others around Britain and so many others around the world are spraying this stuff in the bloody street. Now, how many people on the Isle of Wight alone, through all this period where they've been doing this insanity, have been subject to those diseases and other health effects? And they go to the doctor or they go to the hospital. And of course, no possible connection is ever made. Oh, you've got this, you've got that, you've got the other. What was caused that? Oh, I don't know. It could be, yeah. And it could be that. The evidence suggests that on so many occasions, it will be that. But no. We're told it's safe. And government departments and council departments accept it's safe because they get their uh, decision making in terms of what is safe and what is not from official sources. And official sources and the biotech industry are so often one and the same. Here we are dealing with a company in Monsanto that is producing this stuff and against a background of shocking history of producing um, lethal chemical concoctions and potions that cause mayhem and eventually, um, in many cases, are banned. So that's how bad they must be for the authorities to actually ban them. We've had things like PCBs and Agent Orange. Agent Orange was the infamous, notorious, super deadly herbicide produced by Monsanto, which was applied in Vietnam to kill the foliage so they could get at people to kill them. Well, when they did that to the foliage, they didn't really have to kill them anymore because either immediately or cumulatively and later in life, their death certificate was already signed. It is estimated, and I would suggest these are massive underestimates given what happened, it is estimated that Agent Orange, produced by Monsanto and sprayed in Vietnam by the, um, the, the people who, who only want the best for the world, it's estimated it cost the lives of 400,000 people, caused 500,000 birth defects, and has um, caused health problems and effects for another million people. All these decades later, they're still trying to get rid of it. But despite doing that, Despite the PCBs and all these other things that have caused such mayhem, councils like the Isle of Wight and all these others, government departments, are quite okay with spraying this poisonous potion called Roundup glyphosate in public areas. It's madness. Increasing numbers of countries, not enough for sure yet, are now either banning these things or talking about banning them or having some kind of debate about banning them. And we're going through the process now of, of um, well, this is, this is what happens, okay? You've got something that's poisonous because it's meant to be poisonous because it's meant to kill things, right? And then 
you start getting health effects from people that seem to be connected to this poison. Well, it's a poison, right? And then you have this debate where people, academics and government departments and politicians say, well, do you think that this poison could be poisonous? Hmm, well, we can't, we can't just get rid of it and ban it. I mean, where's the evidence that this poison is poisonous? And so instead of saying, well, in case it's poisonous, we're going to get rid of it, or we're not even going to uh, allow it on until you've shown us, Monsanto, that it's not damaging to human health, then when you've really shown us beyond doubt, then we might let you use this stuff, whatever you're coming up with next. But the opposite happens. Yeah, use it, use it. And, and if it kills people, well, we'll have to ban it. Madness beyond measure. Entities in the unseen the unseen to humans is virtually everything that exists because all that we can decode into a, a visual world is the most laughably tiny frequency range that scientists call visible light. So the idea that what can exist can only exist within visible light or um, the world that we're aware of is utterly ludicrous. All that exists virtually happens outside of our frequency range and therefore it is possible for entities, energies, awareness, whatever people want to call it, to attach to humans in the unseen and manipulate their mental and emotional processes dictate their behavior. And like I say, this has been talked about by ancient cultures right across the world, by the shaman and even the Roman Catholic Church has designated exorcists to remove what they call demons. And around the world, these entities have been given different names but how they're described and how they manipulate, how they possess, is incredibly common. And the themes are incredibly common, the descriptions common. And I'm doing the possession subject this week because um, somebody sent me um, a piece of writing from someone who's known as Rumi. Rumi is a 13th century Persian poet, uh, Islamic scholar, theologian and Sufi mystic. And note that, 13th century. And yet what is described is what is described today in investigations and experiences that people have in relation to what is known as demonic possession. And um, Ruby said this, when a man is possessed by an evil spirit, the qualities of humanity are lost in him. Whatever he says is really said by that spirit, though it seems to proceed from the man's mouth. When the spirit has this rule and dominance over him, the agent is the property of the spirit and not himself. His self is departed and he has become the spirit. And this is the recurring theme that you can chart throughout human history. And like I say, Different cultures give these possessing, manipulating entities different names. Um, the Islamic world, in fact, it comes from the pre-Islamic world, call them jinn, where we get genie. 
Uh, they are called archons by the pagan Gnostic people. They're called flyers by Central American shaman, Chittahuri by the Zulu legends, and so it goes on. And I've been researching this a long time, and the common themes are extremely compelling. And then you come into uh, modern times, and the same themes occur. And it's going to have to dawn on people eventually that these entities exist, that the world that we think we see is a tiny, tiny fraction of what exists, and that our reality is being manipulated in many and various ways, not just through direct possession, um, by entities that we can't see, but certainly impact upon people's mental, emotional uh, states and their or their behaviour. And, you know, some of the, the ways that um, these entities are described is, is, they're so close to each other. For instance, the uh, jinn are described as being made from smokeless fire, whereas the Gnostics said that the archons were made from luminous fire. Wherever you look, the common themes are there to see. And it gives a, it gives a, a much greater fix and perspective on so much that goes on in the world and so much that happens to people when you realize that not only are we not alone, but that which is with us does not necessarily have to arrive in spaceships and flying saucers. It is actually um, energy. Um, think of the, the genie, the genie that can go in the bottle as, as energy in the, in the stories and then come out and take form. This is what is possible where we get our heads out of this obsession with form, obsession with the physical that isn't actually physical. It's just a holographic illusion, as I've talked about in other video casts and at uh, length and in great detail in the books. So when we talk about people being possessed, their, their body is possessed, well, it, it, that's not really the case. If you take the body to be what you can see, what I would call the hologram, um, in the unseen, although the unseen to human sight, but it's uh, able to be photographed by technology now, um, we have um, a number of energetic fields which go under names like the auric field, which some people who have a, a, a greater um, uh, spectrum of visual possibility, they can they can see these energetic fields, and like I say, you can photograph them technologically as well. And uh, we call the people that can see them psychics and other names. But that auric field, which interacts with what we perceive as the body, and um, can dictate mental and emotional states. Um, that's the level that these energetic entities, these jinn, these archons, these whatever name is given around the world, that's the point where they make the connection. And, you know, a, a lot of um, ridicule that's come my way uh, is the fact that I talk about shape-shifting entities, shape-shifting people. And the reason that people in such large numbers go, eh, hey, that bloke's mad, is because they're thinking physical. And what they say is, um, you, can't, you can't shift from a physical body to another physical body. No, you can't. Pushing on an open door, mate. 
But this is the point. The body's not physical. It's illusory physical. It's holographic. It's a projection of energetic fields into us, the unseen. And so if you think of it this way, in terms of possession, for instance, in the most extreme forms of possession, um, the facial um, state, the, often the body state of the possessed person starts to shift, starts to move. You, you get hideous faces appearing, and what have you. Um, and these have been, like I say, charted through history to present day. And what is happening is that their hologram is shape shifting. Why? Because when these entities, these energetic entities, attach to the human energy field, if it's quite a weak attachment, then the impact upon that person's behavior and emotions can be very subtle. It's difficult to perceive there's anything different. But the more that energetic field, in effect an information field of the possessing entity, uh, attaches more powerfully to the target energetic field, then the more the information contained in the possessing field impacts upon the possessed target field. And as that information impacts more and more, it starts to impact upon the nature of the projection, the hologram. And so suddenly someone looks like they used to look. And in states of um, more extreme possession, the information in the possessing field starts to change the nature of the hologram. The person, to anyone observing, starts to change. Their face changes. Sometimes even their whole body can change. And what we're looking at, like I say, is shape-shifting. And when I talk about um, people being able to move between one form and another, what's happening is they're moving between one information field and another. And as that information field um, changes to another, the nature of the holographic projection changes. And to the observer, it appears that a physical body has changed to another type of physical body. It hasn't, because there is no physical body. An information shift has taken place, which um, means that the projection, the hologram, changes its nature in relation to the information. A piece of land occupied, at least in 2013, be less now, by 22 million people. A piece of land that is little bigger than North Dakota. And I'm talking, of course, about Syria. Now, in that country of less than 22 million people now, and little bigger than the size of North Dakota, I'd like to make a list. We have America bombing, France bombing, Turkey bombing, Israel bombing, Kurds attacking, US uh, backed, armed and trained rebels bombing and attacking. We have ISIS bombing and attacking. We have Iran having a military presence there. And now we have Russia starting to bomb that land this week. Very much um, in the not too distant background is China. And of course we have the psychopath that is David Cameron, absolutely desperate to get the British Air Force involved also in bombing this land.
if anyone ever needed confirmation, and of course we don't, that we live in a lunatic asylum, then the events of Syria are the confirmation. Does anyone really think that all this is going on? All these countries involved, all this bombing, all this death, destruction, suffering and refugee creation is happening because the West morally feels that President Assad is a tyrant oppressing his people and therefore um, the opposition to him in the country must be supported. Does anyone really believe that? The idea that the United States and Britain alone have any interest whatsoever in the oppression of people when the British Empire and the American Empire that is but not named have spent centuries oppressing people all over the world for their own economic benefit and accumulation of power. They could not give a damn about what is happening in Syria in terms of oppression of the people or whatever else they claim. We have a situation where one of the greatest oppressors of humanity on the planet, Saudi Arabia, which executes someone on average about every two days at the moment, is part of the coalition to stop oppression in Syria? We have ISIS, rightly, vilified and condemned for the horrors of beheading as a tool of trauma and control and terror. And yet, we have Saudi Arabia beheading with not a murmur from the same moral West. They are bombing mercilessly civilians in Yemen without a murmur from the moral West that arms them and allows them to do it. So it's pretty bloody clear that the cover story of we must help the people of Syria is a load of fricking bollocks. So there's another reason which I'm going to come to in this video cast and there are many levels to it. I am sick beyond words at the moral hypocrisy of the Obamas and the Camerons and the Blairs and the Bushes and all these others, the Holons and the Sarkozy's, war criminals, a lot of them, psychopaths, who talk about how they must stand for freedom and justice while bombing the crap out of country after country and leaving mayhem and violence behind them. 
we have a moral United States that has held a British citizen, Shaka Arma, in Guantanamo Bay for 13 years without charge or trial, an innocent man taken from his family and his children, a man denied seeing his children grow up, as a child he's not even seen because he was born after he was taken into captivity by these psychopaths. We have children, his children, who've been denied a father in their childhood by a nation, a government representing a nation more like it, and even more so a hidden hand behind governments, whichever the complexion that are driving this horrific treatment of people. We have a American administration under whatever color that can do that to a human being and still claim the moral high ground. So, we have the next stage this week of the Syrian crisis. And that is the introduction of Russia as a bomber. Must have more bombs. Cameron must come in and have more bombs because of course bombs sort everything, don't they? And it's a very, very dangerous situation on a much bigger level, as I'll come to in this video cast. Because on this um, piece of land called Syria, we now have lining up Russia with China in the background, but not far in the background, like I say, and Iran too, against the American, British, French led West with Israel, the elephant in the living room, behind them. And obviously, um, President Putin has gone in there to protect this, the Assad government. Not just to do that, but to protect um, Russian military and naval interests in Syria from the gathering chaos, upheaval, and takeover. And when the first strikes, anyway, were against um, what people are not calling ISIS, but opponents of the Assad government, well, that all makes sense because Russia well know, and it's becoming more and more accepted, the initial um, trigger that brought about this whole catastrophe was through American trained, armed and funded rebels, many of which had just been shipped over from doing the same in Libya. And so what we have now, in effect, is a emerging proxy war on that land between definitely Russia, supported by China and Iran, who are attacking American-backed uh, rebels. And I love them. I love them. They, they call them moderates. There is no moderation in what any of them are doing in Syria. And it could go any way. But I am going to talk later about um, something that was predicted a long time ago, which current events are absolutely mirroring decades later. Greece and the Greek financial uh, collapse 
and it looks at the time I'm recording this anyway as if the Greek government has blinked and is going to suggest that austerity measures imposed by the creditors are accepted and introduced or at least significant amounts of those austerity measures anyway. And it's not really a surprise because countries now are, especially those in the single currency like the euro, are under the complete control virtually of those that control that currency and control whether that country or that country has um, enough of the currency available to exchange, to cause and create economic activity. And so, as was pointed out by some of us um, from the start, once you um, ditch your own currency and go to a multiple single currency with others, whoever controls that currency controls you. As members of the Rothschild family have said over the years, give me control of a nation's currency and I care not who makes the laws, the rules. Well, give me control of a currency for virtually the whole of the European Union and I'll control the European Union no matter who makes the rules. And this is the case all over the world. It's not politicians that control and dictate events. It's bankers. And it's bankers and this currency, which I'm going to get to in a second, which decide who has what, who eats and doesn't eat, who has a home and doesn't have a home, who has a job or no job. And it decides the choices in their lives of almost everyone on the planet. Because talk to uh, most people, and if they're not doing what they want to do, the reason they're not doing it is because I don't have the money, mate. So money has been created not for its um, useful purpose of being a unit of exchange to overcome the limitations of barter, but as a form of not only control, but to acquire, hijack, and take over the wealth of the planet, and through that, humanity in general. So, people say that money is the root of all evil, um, but that's not what the phrase says. It says the love of money is the root of all evil, and I would add another um, line to that. The control of money is the root of all evil, along with interest on money, because Money as a unit of exchange to overcome the limitations of barter has a positive contribution to make. But once you introduce interest, for reasons I'll come to, um, then you have created the vehicle for a very few people to take over the wealth of the planet. So this Greek crisis and the ones in Ireland and Portugal and, and Spain and Italy and elsewhere, are all connected and based upon this money, this currency, whatever name you give it, sterling, euro, whatever. And through this currency, people's lives are controlled. Those that have it compare with those who don't have it. So, what is this money? that has such fundamental power over people's lives. Well, we have a phrase, certainly this part of the world, I don't know how further it goes, called funny money. And this is the definition of funny money. Currency or money that is counterfeit or worthless or whose value is otherwise illusory. Okay, that's funny money. So what is this money that controls our lives and is dictating austerity in Greece and elsewhere? 
people that control it anyway are imposing that austerity. Well, it's officially called fiat money. And this is a definition of fiat money. Paper money or coins of little or no intrinsic value in themselves and not convertible into gold or silver, but made legal tender by fiat order of the government. So this money that dictates and controls people's lives to, to such a fine detail extent has no intrinsic value and is only able to be exchanged for goods and services because the government says, or in this case the European Union, the European Central Bank in terms of the euro, say it has value. The term fiat comes from the Latin meaning of let it be done, it shall be. And this nicely describes the process of uh, uh, money with no value being exchanged for goods and services only because of the perception that it has value. And this is a definition of fiat money from the um, Investopedia website. It's a currency that a government has declared to be legal tender, but is not backed by a physical commodity. The value of fiat money is derived from the relationship between supply and demand, rather than the value of the material that the money is made of. Um, historically, most currencies were based on physical commodities, such as gold or silver, but fiat money is based solely on faith, exactly. And once it's based on faith, it's a manipulator's party trick, because all you have to do is put out a rumour that some currency is uh, or country is in trouble, and the value of the currency drops. Or you um, uh, take your massive amounts of uh, uh, money, investments, out of a country, which makes the a perception of the financial stability of that country uh, changed to one of doubt and suddenly the value of the uh, financial uh, structure of that country uh, goes down. It's a piece of cake and the dollar, the pound sterling, the euro, all of these things are fiat money, worthless in and of itself. And um, the uh, definition in this article goes on, because fiat money is not linked to physical reserves, it risks becoming worthless due to hyperinflation. If people lose faith in a, currency, a nation's paper currency, like the dollar bill, the money will no longer be of any value. It says most modern paper currencies are fiat currencies, have no intrinsic value and are used solely as a means of payment. Um, historically, governments would mint coins out of a physical commodity such as gold or silver or would print paper money that could be redeemed for a set amount of a physical commodity. Fiat money is inconvertible and cannot be redeemed. Um, fiat money rose to prominence in the 20th century, specifically after the collapse of the Bretton Woods system in 1971, when the United States ceased to allow the conversion of the dollar into gold. And as I've uh, uh, described in my books, that process of, of creating fiat, intrinsically worthless money, was all part of the manipulation to use that system to take over the wealth of the world in ways that I'm going to... Um, explain. So we have a currency in which um, not having enough of it causes or is justifying austerity. Having loads of it means that you can buy the real wealth of the world, the, the land, the property, the resources. Um, and it's intrinsically bloody worthless. But shocking as that may seem, it gets worse. How does this fiat, intrinsically valueless money, come into circulation? And people say, oh, yeah, well, governments do it, don't they? No, no. The vast, overwhelming majority of fiat currency comes into existence by private banks, as I show in the books, um, in the end, controlled by the same people, um, making loans called credit what is credit? It's money that does not exist. Never mind fiat money, it doesn't actually exist. It's a theoretical entity called credit. 
And it comes from something else that runs alongside uh, fiat money called fractional reserve lending. This allows the banks to lend vastly more than they have on deposit. And, this is the key, charge interest on it. And so when you go to a bank to you know, borrow 50,000 uh, pounds or dollars or something, the bank doesn't do anything more than type into your account 50,000 pounds or dollars. That's it. It's created it out of nothing through fractional reserve lending, which says, although you've only got this on deposit, you can, you can lend far more. How has this come about? Because as I've been showing in the books all these years, the same people that control the banks control the governments, which pass the law that apply to banks. So, you borrow, say, £50,000, and it's been typed into your account. It's been created out of nothing. Uh, now, you buy a car and you give someone £10,000 for the car. That person then takes the £10,000 that has been created out of nothing um, through a creation of credit, and they put that £10,000 in their bank. Now their bank can lend nine, ten times more in truth. The value of the £10,000, by creating credit on the basis of that, for other people. Now, you imagine on that basis how much money credit is created by the banks by one single loan being passed from bank to bank as people um, spend it, receive it, spend it, and receive it. It's extraordinary. That's one loan. And people um, wonder how the banks and the People controlling the financial system have taken over the world and dictate to governments and decide who eats and doesn't eat, who, who lives and who doesn't. Jewish people. Because there are significant numbers of Jewish people who are not Zionists and many who vehemently oppose Zionism. There are Jewish organizations set up to do just that. Jewish people and Zionism are not necessarily the same thing because Zionism is a political movement within Jewish people which has taken over so much of Jewish society. In fact, almost completely dominates it to the point where um, the general population think that when you're talking about and challenging Zionism, you are being anti-Jewish. Um, for me, anyone that reads my um, books about reality um, will see that, uh, to me, racism and judging people by their body uh, for whatever reason, is not only grotesque, it's bloody stupid. It's ridiculous. We are consciousness having an experience um, of a reality through the vehicle to experience that reality. And once you start um, judging people by the nature of their vehicle, it's a bit like... Um, being prejudiced against a guy in a spacesuit because it's a different colour to yours and was made by a different manufacturer somewhere else in the world. Madness. But that's what racism is. It's stupidity and a complete misunderstanding of self, life and everything. And racism is not something you are born with. It's something that is developed through programmed ignorance and prejudice. I mean, you know, you put children of different colours and backgrounds together, little babies, and they'll get on fine. 
but you put them together as adults a few decades later, and they might not get on fine at all, but they might be going to war with each other, might be prejudiced against each other. Um, and if you are born, for instance, into a Jewish family, into a Muslim family, or into a, um, a Christian family, you are far more likely to follow um, the religion of Judaism or the religion of um, Islam or the religion of Christianity than you are if you're not born into those families. And in the same way, if you are brought up in uh, a community that is prejudiced or a family that's prejudiced on the basis of race, then you are far more likely to be racist yourself in the same way. It's all programming. It's all reality downloading. So let's get that out of the way first of all. When I challenge international Zionism, and I do vehemently, I'm not um, being anti-Jewish. I'm being uh, anti the agenda and the actions of international Zionism, which is a political movement um, created by the House of Rothschild. And the creation of the State of Israel was not for the benefit of Israelis and Jewish people living in Israel. It was for the benefit of an international agenda of which international Zionism is a very important part. And it's based for a start on a lie. Um, the lie that Jewish people today have any historical connection to the land called Israel. You've only got to look, and I've detailed it in my own books, but you've only got to look at Jewish historians um, who've um, produced their research to show that um, what we call Jewish people today overwhelmingly came from a people called the Khazars in the Caucasus um, part of the world, around what is now Georgia. And um, when the Khazar Empire um, was in place, um, the Kagan, or king, um, had a mass conversion to Judaism for various reasons. And you note that the king of Khazaria was called Kagan. And that's why Kagan is such a uh, common and um, obvious uh, Jewish name today. And when you follow this history, when the Khazar Empire broke up, the people moved northwards into Russia and into um, the countries that we now would call um, Europe and Eastern Europe, and then west into Germany. And um, they were the people that suffered under the Nazis. They were the people after the war that moved, um, not least thanks to the uh, manipulation of the House of Rothschild, to America, and particularly through the manipulation of the House of Rothschild, um, to what is now called Israel. And it's based on the idea that um, the biblical people um, and Israelites are the same people as Jewish people today. They're not, as even um, Jewish historians have said and written. So the whole thing about Zionism, which is based on a political movement to create a homeland for Jewish people in Israel, on the basis of um, them having an historical right to it, is bollocks. So the whole foundation of it is bollocks. Um, and what you have is not just a political movement uh, where people call themselves Zionists because they support that philosophy of a homeland for Jewish people in Israel on the basis of an historical lie. 
at its core, it's a secret society. And it's a secret society that does not have the best interests of Jewish people at heart. Um, they are as much fodder to be used and abused and hung out to dry by the um, secret society at the inner core of Zionism as any other people. Um, and the way the treatment of Jewish people in Germany by the Nazis was grotesquely um, exploited by the Rothschilds and their um, fellow members of this Zionist secret society um, was just a horrific example of what I mean was exploited to create the long-term goal of a um, homeland for Jews in Israel, not for the benefit of them, but for the benefit of the Rothschild agenda. You will see the research, I do it myself, and it needs doing, into political manipulation, financial manipulation, manipulation of wars, engineered terrorist attacks and all that. And that needs to be done. But the bottom line, surely, is to understand the very reality that we're experiencing. What we call life, what we call the world. What is it? It seems, on the face of it, to be very simple. It's a planet, it's a universe, and it's um, solid and stuff. It's all matter. But when you, um, when you go deeper into it, actually not very deep, really, to start with, none of that is true. We don't live in a solid world. Quantum physics has shown that for a long time. We live in an 